If you'd open with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 is a beautiful portion of God's Word that describes to us the kind of mind that God expects from us. More than anything else, God wants to control our minds this morning. You see, if God controls our minds, he has our bodies. If God controls our minds, he has our appetites. If God controls our minds this morning, he has our time. If God controls our minds this morning, he has our finances. Right down the line, it all comes back that the prize of control is of the mind. And God says, everything else are the scraps. I want your mind. I want your mind focused entirely with your affections and desires toward me. So the scriptures tell us that the one who gets your mind gets it all. Your mind is the prize. And so the battlefield this morning is for our minds, and Satan is seeking to steal, to divert, to distract the minds of God's people away from God. Only a mind which has stayed on the Lord can have the perfect peace that God offers. As we've studied, the concept of a personal cessation, a personal resting, a personal, to use the scriptural word, Sabbath, from the world, from activity. We've seen that a personal Sabbath rest is the road to God's perfect peace filling our minds. But sadly, it seems that Satan has caught so many believers off guard. While they carefully avoid the obvious dangers and evils, perhaps the most powerful and the most deadly of the mind robbers has been overlooked. And what we see today is Satan neutralizing the power of a godly mind a little bit every day. How? Through the onslaught of the inescapable media in which we in our world today are immersed. And this morning, I'd like to talk to you about the world which flows around us like a raging, flooded river every day. Now, before we read the first 17 verses of Colossians, I want you to just think about the world in which we live. Just sit, and instead of looking at your world, just sit and Think outward at the world that surrounds us. And let me just give you a little picture of the world in which we live that we must apply, Colossians 3, 1 through 17, into the world in which we live, as the scriptures tell us to. I wonder, first of all, has it troubled you yet that our modern media has totally reset what is morally acceptable? In other words, the moral acceptability threshold has moved. It's been reset by the media around us. Here's what one media critic, who is not a believer, but when the unbelievers are saying things that the Bible says, we should look up and say we should be saying much louder the same things. This is what uh, Al Mansoni said. Do the things that once offended you now entertain you? Are you able to enjoy the company of television programs and videos and movies that have values that are diametrically opposed to your own? That's what an unbeliever says. How about values that are diametrically opposed to the one that owns us, that it lives in us, whose Holy Spirit indwells us? Can we comfortably enjoy the company of the media, of the television, of the videos, of the movies, that militate against God? That's a fair question. The moral drift in our culture of America and the world is important to understand because it's continuing unabated. Now, we already know how it ends. Revelation 9, we studied every uh, part of the book of Revelation in 1998, but Revelation 9 says that when Christ comes back at the climax of the tribulation, it says that people are totally given over to three things. They're totally given over to the occult, to immorality, and to materialism. What are the three big themes of our media today? Television, games, movies, and entertainment. The occult, embodied in science fiction, the super-achieving human with powers inside of them. 
the force, the occult. Immorality, you can't sell a stick of gum or a toothbrush without attaching a pretty girl to it, or a pretty boy if you're in California in the gay community. And materialism. People make life or death decisions with dollar marks on them, not with God, with dollar marks. And if the zeros and the commas are enough, they'll change their lifestyle and do it for the money. That's how the world is when Christ returns at the height of the tribulation. That's what our media is conditioning us to be open to the occult, to be open to immorality, and to be seduced by materialism. Well, just extrapolate 10 or 20 years into the future, and it's frightening to imagine what our media content will be. If you graph where we've gone in my lifetime, I'm 44, and I can remember from when I was about four or five year old, years old onward, and I regularly tell my children, I can't believe where it's going. Well, just put some more bars on the graph and look where it's going to be in 20 years because it's exponentially getting more wicked. Number two, not only has it troubled you that the moral acceptability threshold has moved, has it troubled you yet that the modern media has reset what shocks us? Now, another critic... Um, wrote this. He said, in the past, if we saw blood killing or tragedies on the evening news, it would disturb us for weeks. I distinctly remember the uh, Kent State shooting. I mean, that was the first time I ever saw a real live human being killed. Do you remember that, that picture of that girl that was on her knees and the guy was laying down, his blood was going right down that campus. So that's in a National Guardsman in a, some situation had shot him somehow. It was just a tragic thing. I couldn't forget that. That was the first person I'd ever seen killed I mean, on TV, there was a real person that wasn't Matt Dillon getting the bad guy, you know. I mean, it was a death. And now, it's nothing. Death is nothing. It's the rule of the newsroom. If it bleeds, it leads, is what newscasters say. And movies are worse. Beginning about 30 years ago in the 70s, succeeding waves of movies began to rely more and more on violence in order to attract a crowd. You know, it's the... Rambo, Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, which has become now far more than strongmen and military. It's become demonic violence. Audiences became numb to the repulsiveness as each level of violence ratcheted upward so that directors have to keep enhancing the horror factor to maintain interest. And such has become common fare, and it doesn't seem to offend most people, because the shock threshold keeps going up. Also, has it troubled you yet that God says in the book of Ezekiel that this is how he defines spiritual adultery. It is the sin of his people spending and investing more and more of their time, getting their help, getting their counsel, getting their direction, and getting their advice from sources other than him. He says, my people. They find their advice for their health, for their finances, for their lives, for their families. They find it everywhere but from me. Now let me ask you this. If God told his people, God who doesn't change, he would like to have a part in their decisions and the, giving them advice. If we get primarily our advice our counsel, our direction, and, and knowing how to live our lives primarily from television, secular books, and unsafe professionals, and, and magazines, and commercials, and off the internet, and we know more about advice from there than from God's word, God says that's spiritual adultery. Now, in the Old Testament, he says, I'm married to you. Israel was married to God, and he gave them a certificate of divorce and put them out. And then he took them back. We're not married. We're engaged. And it, a lot of you know that you're even more intensely careful when you're engaged to be married, to love and adore and honor and to, to show respect to that one you're going to be married to, to set a right pattern. God says for his church, I want you to seek me first and my rule over every part of your life. Has it troubled you yet? that today's teens, and I'm talking about the 31 million 12 through 19-year-olds that live in our homes here, 
have a world that has been defined for them more. More. Their world has been defined more by computer games, TV, movies, advertisements for Nike, Sony, Tommy, Hilfiger, and Nintendo, and Adidas, and Gap, and Old Navy, and the World Wide Web. More by all that than by God's Word. Does that trouble you? They know more about what clothes and electronic gizmos and sports stuff and everything else that the world is doing than they know about this book. And the Word of Christ, by and large, often does not richly dwell in the minds of young people today. Maybe because it doesn't dwell in their parents' minds, I don't know. Has it troubled you yet that television's effects have been chronicled by unsaved, non-regenerated statisticians? I mean, let me read to you what Neil Postman, he's a, a Jew, wonderful, brilliant genius, unsaved, does not know God, does not know God's word, does not know the grace of Jesus Christ. Here's what he said. He spent, he spent a greater part of his life studying American culture. He wrote a thesis called Amusing Ourselves to Death, The Decline of American Culture. Uh, about eight years ago he wrote this. And this is what his statistics are. I'll read his statistics and then let me apply them to us, okay? Here, four points. He says, the undisciplined watching of television. Now this... Boy, that's archaic. Television's old hat nowadays. But just watching television, unregulated. In other words, just watching it whenever you want to. This was his conclusion, fourfold. One, it shortens your attention span. Number two, he says, a diminution. You know what that means? You diminish your ability to communicate verbally. You ever notice that younger people, they go, <laughs> they don't even talk in complete sentences anymore. How you doing? Hey. They, they, don't, they don't write, they don't talk, they don't communicate. They don't hardly communicate with adults. You know what I love to do? I love to walk up to a group of kids and say, hey, how you doing? They go, hmm. They don't know how to talk to adults. They wonder who they are. They live in a fantasy world that, that is primarily, they cannot tell in our movies, in the games, in the television, in our culture, the line between reality and, and fantasy is gone. Movies have rewritten history. I mean, most people, they know more about American history from the patriot than they do from reading a history book. It's the rewriting of history. But, thirdly, he says, it limits our capacity for abstraction. I mean, I remember when I was little, my toy, I'd have a tin can, you know, with both ends cut out. And I'd, I'd fly it. Then I'd sit it down and I'd shoot at it. Oh, that's socially unacceptable, but I used to do it anyway. Then I'd use it as a telescope. And then I would throw rocks at it. And then other times I'd collect them and build a castle out of them. Now, a child has to have the latest electronic whatever, and he'll cast it aside after two weeks and wants another one. That's our culture. The, the inability to have a capacity for abstraction. Finally, this whole media has blurred adulthood and childhood. Children, thanks to the, oh, the moral perfidies of, or... or wickedness of our administration has been exposed in the evening news over the last four years to stuff that adults never talked about in history, normal adults. And now everybody talks about it, and they blurred the line between adulthood and childhood. Well, let me apply this. A shortened attention span, that means that someone who is a regular television watcher, according to Neil Postman, can't think about God very well. Why? Because it takes time to think about God. He says, you have to seek me with all your heart. The Psalms say you have to unite your heart. And so if I have to get my heart all united, and then I have to raise it up and focus on God, that takes time. And if I'm used to split-second graphics moving me along, that's what amusement is. Alpha privative on the word for meditate, a Alpha privative means not. Muse, word for meditate. I do not meditate. Amusement means I don't have to think. I just am carried along. God says you have to think to know me. That's why he wants our mind. Secondly, if we have a reduced linguistic power, that means a regular television watcher can't talk about God very well. Boy, do we see that. Do you know what the biggest holdup to people joining our church is? They don't want to give their testimony. Their testimony is the greatest thing that you have. It is your declaration that God saved me and how he did it. Two-thirds of everybody that signs up for membership, when they find out that you have to read your testimony in front of a group of people, they say, I'm sorry, don't want to do that. 
That's astounding to me. It could be a product of our culture. We have trouble talking about God. You know, if you talk about God at home, the biblical family, the scriptures say, talks about God when they rise up, when they sit at the meals, when they go through the day, and when they go to bed. The whole day is surrounded with God. If you talk about God in all those places, you will not have trouble talking about him anywhere. If you don't talk about him in all those places, you'll have trouble talking about him anywhere. You see the difference? God says, I want you to talk about me. Finally, the blur of adulthood, it's tragic. Well, has it troubled you yet that what you choose for your mind today will shape your eternal future? That's what Paul's talking about in Colossians 3. If you choose to watch godlessness, it will callous you. If you choose to watch sensuality, it will defile your mind. If you choose to regularly watch violence, it will desensitize you. The greatest emotion of Christ was compassion. Do you know what's lacking in our culture today? Compassion. Now, you know, I can only tell you this because this has been so much on my mind over the last few weeks, but I, I started thinking about the Good Samaritan, you know, and the guy wrecked on the road, and I thought, all oh, these people you see broken down, you know. You, it's the people with the old cars that always break down. You know, their cars break down by the road, and you look at them, and how many, you know, you just say, oh, I hope they call AAA. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be late where I'm going. <laughs> Isn't that the story of the Good Samaritan? The Levite said, I don't want to be late when I'm going. Too bad. I hope AAA gets that guy by the roadside. Christians are supposed to be compassionate. Well, I saw someone with a flat tire. It's not very good to stop. It was a lady. She had the wrong end of the car open. She was looking under the trunk for her tire. So I had to tell her it was at the other end of the car. She was using the wrong end of the jack. She was using the pointed end trying to get the tire off. I said, you're going to pop your tire. You use the round end and you get those screws. Okay. She had the manual. She was looking in the wrong section of the manual. I actually got dirty helping her. But you know what it taught me? How uncommon it is for us to show compassion. We are so busy and so afraid that we don't show compassion. Well, if you choose to watch evil, it will distance you from God. Have you ever felt distant from someone? You know, they said something, or you said something, or you made a misunderstanding or whatever, and all of a sudden you kind of feel distant from them? You know, God says, if you choose to look at evil, you will feel distant from me. If we choose evil, Psalm 66, 18, God says, if you regard, that's an old word for look at iniquity, I won't hear you. That means distance. If we choose to watch worldliness, it will discourage our spiritual life. Bluntly saying, I could put all this in one sentence, don't say you're committed to Christ unless you're pursuing the mind of Christ. What is that? Colossians 3. And we're going to read the first 17 verses. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17. If, then, you were raised with Christ, Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 3, seek those things which are above. So he says, your whole orientation goes from living to stay in lockstep with below world living, and you change your orientation upward. You turn your satellite dish toward the satellite that's communicating with you. You set your attention, your affections upward. How do you do that? Well, look at verse 2. Set your mind on things above. Turn to that channel. Think on God. Look for God. Look at verse 5. He's specific. By the way, 13 put-offs. What I mean? 13 things. I mean, Paul didn't just throw out the truth. He applied it. He says, if you are born again, you are going to put off some things. You're going to avoid. You're going to unplug them. You're going to deny them. Which are on the earth, your members. And here's the list. I won't read them all, but there are 13 of them. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Do you know what that is? That is the content of the majority of media in our world. Right there listed. Some more in verse 8. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. If you're supposed to put off filthy language, how can you pay someone to swear for you? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I don't know where you know where you are, and it doesn't matter. We aren't supposed to keep track of everyone, but some people think you never go to movies, and some people think you can go to any movies. But I remember Bonnie and I, a few weeks ago, someone said, this is a wonderful movie. You ought to go. It's so sweet. So we went. We didn't even get to see the movie. The previews were so bad, we were offended. We lost our $9. We left. 
I mean, I got in there. I was assaulted with an invisible man raping some woman. That was a preview. Then Harrison Ford, some ghost, was trying to have an affair with him. And after that, this child was blessed by the devil, and he was screaming around, and everybody they were trying to sacrifice the child. It was all immorality in the cult. And I mean, I had my eyes closed the whole time, but I could still hear some of this stuff. So I said, honey, and she said the same thing. We left, and we threw away our 450 tickets in the trash and left. You know why? God was offended. I should be offended, too. Why pay someone to be filthy in front of you? Don't, don't do that. But look at verse 10. Here's the positive. 13 put-offs. Verse 10, he gives 12 put-ons. Put on the new man, renewed in knowledge according to the image of him. How do you do that? Verse 12, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 14, put on love. How do you do all this? Verse 16, let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly. Dwell where? In your mind. God wants our mind more than anything else this morning. Let's bow together and ask him to teach us his way. Father in heaven, in these brief moments we have this morning, we are barraged with a relentless assault of media in every form, musical, video, print, graphic, everything. Oh, Lord, help us to learn how to live in the world but not be of the world. Help us not to be isolated, go off a thousand miles from any known sin, which is impossible, but rather be insulated with a mind that is kept by you and that rests in your word, richly filling it. Teach us some truths this morning. Help us to know how you apply this great calling in Christ to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, why do we need to rest and cease from wandering minds? Well, it's because the Lord gave us the example. Probably most of us have never thought about the fact that when Jesus lived, It was not the nice world to live in. The cities in which Jesus served are cities that were characterized by gymnasiums. You say, that doesn't mean anything to me. Well, if you knew the Greek language, it would mean something to you. Gymnos means naked. Jesus, in town after town into which he served, in the Decapolis and the Roman region, had people who didn't wear spandex. They wore no decks. They wore nothing. That's how they did their athletics back then. So we're not talking about, uh, oh, well, they had it easy. They all wore robes back then. We're talking about a vicious, wicked, awful, immoral culture then and now. So what did Jesus do to his disciples that were constantly barraged? Well, let's turn back to Mark, where we ended last time, chapter 6, before we go to chapter 2. Mark chapter 6. Jesus regularly called his disciples to do something. He told them that he, first he taught them about Sabbath rest, and he said Sabbath rest is is made for man to cease and to get away from everything to focus on God. Then he demonstrated in Mark 6, 31. And he says, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest. You know what Shabbat or Sabbath or Sabbaton means? It means to cease, stop, or rest. Now, there are many applications. I've been applying it. This is the eighth week I've been applying it. But the concept is this. Most focused this morning, if you want to have a Christian mind, you've got to cease and stop the barrage for a period of time, close the gate, and rest in the truth of God. Now, Jesus and the disciples needed to cease from their labors and rest, and so should we. Our spiritual lives need a time of reflection. We need a time of rest. We need a time of renewal. We need time to refocus back on what we were saved from and saved for. In the past seven weeks, we've learned the New Testament perspective on the Sabbath. I'll just summarize it. Number one, the Lord's Day is not simply the Christian Sabbath. Move from the seventh day to the first. That's unbiblical. Secondly, The Old Testament Mosaic Sabbath day was superseded by the Lord's Day. The early church said Jesus rose on the first day, Sunday, and that became their meeting day and their day of worship. The Catholics didn't do it. You know, a lot of people say, oh, the Catholics did that. The Catholics, well, the Catholics did do it. 
The Roman Catholics didn't. The early church did it. The Catholic Universal Church of Jesus Christ superseded under the revelation of God the day from Saturday to Sunday. Thirdly, the New Testament character of the Lord's Day was worship. Our Lord's Day ought to be observed as much as possible in the same way. What did they meet on the Lord's Day to do? They met to break bread, to fellowship, to have the teaching of God's word, to worship the risen Christ, to be in the spirit on the Lord's Day. That's why they met. Number four, New Testament Christians do not and did not have to follow the Mosaic Sabbath stringent commands to desist from labor and to rest. That command wasn't transferred to the Lord's Day. That's why we're not around checking out what everybody's doing on the Lord's Day. We're not supposed to check what everybody else is doing. We're supposed to do what God has directed us to do, to seek him, to cease from the blur and to focus on him. Finally, we saw that wise Christians will incorporate a Sabbath rest principle into their observance of the Lord's Day as best they can. Not because the law says it, because the rest principle is noted in our universe. God twice said, I created the world in six days, I rested the seventh. Was he tired? I mean, God, the omnipotent? No, it was a principle for us. And then it says in the Bible in in Exodus 20 that God took his finger, actually Exodus 19 and 20, and God wrote in stone. You know what one of the sentences God wrote with his own finger? The only time we know of God writing something. He wrote in stone, six days shalt thou labor, and the seventh shalt thou rest. It's not in stone as a law for us, but it's a a principle of this universe that God has built rest into the cycle. And there's a Genesis rhythm to life which, if observed, will benefit us physically and spiritually. We covered that. Well, the rest God commends is a ceasing from the blur of daily life, a pausing and a resting in God by a focused time of seeking him. What does it do? It rivets our minds back on him. Now, the question to see if we need this is, Does your mind, by default, go back to God? Now, those of you that have computers know what I mean. Computers are really interesting boxes that have a program inside, and we get to alter them a little bit, but every so often we alter them too much, and they get mixed up, and they freeze up, and we go, you know, alt, delete, whatever it is. I know where they are, but you hit those three keys and start, or most people just turn it off and turn it back on. You know what it does? It defaults back to its original settings, which were built into it. When God gives us a new heart, he gives us a new default setting so that when our lives get frazzled, we go back to him. Do your mind, thoughts, attentions, desires default back to God? Colossians 3.1, do you set your affection on things above? Do you seek the things which are above? Especially the busier, the hectic, the more, the more inundated with the wickedness of the media, does that draw your heart toward God? If not, then you need to practice a Sabbath cessation from all that stuff that's getting your attention and get back into this book. Well, what are the benefits or the rewards of this Godward mind, a mind that's stayed on the Lord, a mind that's renewed, fixed on the king above? Well, it's beyond description. The Bible says this, Isaiah 26, 3, it's a perfect peace, a tranquility as we go through life. doesn't mean we never have problems. We have more problems. We have our flesh problems. We have spiritual problems. We have everything. But a perfect peace through all those problems. Embodied by, do you remember when Paul and, and Silas were down in the prison? What were they doing? Singing. With their backs bleeding, with their feet stretched out in stocks, in great pain with all the infection and everything down in it filthy, vile prison. They were worshiping God. Isaiah 48, 18 says, God's peace would be like a river in our life. Jesus said this in Matthew 11, come to me when you're heavy laden. Let me give you rest. What do most people have trouble with? Their emotions. God says, I'll give you rest for your souls. That's an indescribable benefit of having our mind fixed on the Lord. Well, we're concluding our study of the Sabbath. We saw the purpose of the Sabbath. It was made for man. The promises of the Sabbath. God says, I'll delight you. Sabbath laws were not under them. Sabbath blessings, as we apply this to our life, they are countless. We've seen Sabbath thieves, things that rob us, legalism, being Sabbath snoopers on other people, and lots of other stuff. We looked at Sabbath plans. 
little ways that we can change our life to bring rest into them. If I was selling a book and I said, I would like to offer you a book that was written by Jesus and the apostles and the Old Testament prophets of their illustrations of how to see Jesus Christ most perfectly and clearly, wouldn't you like to read about their illustrations that they used? I collect books. I have thousands of books. If I can find an original source on something, it's very valuable to me. Not what someone said about someone, what the person said about something. If you could read the illustrations that Jesus and his apostles and all the Old Testament prophets used to point to Jesus, wouldn't that be fascinating? That is what the Old Testament feasts were, designed by God as a picture of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege we have to see the illustrations of Jesus. But this morning, why do we need a Sabbath rest? And in seven or eight minutes, I'm going to tell you how, so hold on, okay? A visitor last week told me, they said, you know, the closer it gets to time to go, the faster you talk. I said, that's true. Here we go. The exhausting pace of our lives wears down our Godward mind. Most of us, the Lord's Day would be the best day to rest because Christianity's past influence on our culture has made the weekend what the time is most people have off. So as Christians, we ought to make the most of it. And we should forget our regular labors and focus on things that recreate our bodies, you say, in our minds and our souls. What is that? Well, recreation nowadays, nowadays in 21st century America is hedonistic pleasure pursuit. I mean, people, they've got to be doing all kinds of stuff and they're exhausted. Monday morning they walk in like this because they were at the lake all weekend, just worn out. Do you know what recreation really was originally? Recreation. It was having a day of the week where you could spend a long time at a meal talking to your family getting to know people in an unhurried way. I recently addressed a group of parents, and I said, you know what would be neat for you to take a two-hour time at your meal and spend time reading the Word and, and in front of your children, blessing your wife scripturally, and then praying over each one of your children. And someone came up to me immediately when I got done, and they looked at me and they said, my family could never do that. We could never eat for two hours. Never. I said, really? Another one came up to me and says, we only eat two meals a month at our house. They eat all their meals in restaurants. Great. They're loaded. Read the Bible there. You know what I mean? Spend time. I mean, if you're going to live in a restaurant, take your Bible in. You know, it'll, maybe you'll have to tip a little bit more. I don't know. But just spend time because the exhausting pace of our lives wears down our minds. And God says you need a time to, as a family, pull back and focus. And I don't mean once on the five-year reunions. I mean on a, a weekly basis. Do you know the definition of family has changed? In God's word, a family was a group of people who shared their lives. Today, a family is a group of people who live in isolation in the same house. 58% of all young people have a television in their room. What a horrible thing. So they get to choose between you and the TV. Which do you think is more interesting? Which do you think is easier to talk to? Not you. You might disagree with them. The television. You see what we've done? We have a group of people living in a house that don't share life together. They don't even share meals together. Finally, not only do we need rest because of the exhausting pace of the world that wears down the Godward mind, but the inescapable media of our world is constantly neutralizing our Godward mind. Has it troubled you yet that according to those who track these things, teenagers will watch 50 movies a year in the theater and watch another 50 on video. And 80% of them will be PG-13 or R-rated. Does that trouble you? It troubles me. I just told you a minute ago that, that now I have a personal philosophy that I won't watch the previews. They'll offend me too much. I won't be able to stay for the movie. I told my children, I said, if you go with groups of people, spend extra time at the popcorn thing. Don't go in during the previews. Miss the first minute of the movie, but don't watch the filth before it starts. That's not what I sent you for. It seems like most movies are continuing their slide in the direction of violence, nudity, objectionable language. Most blockbuster movies have to have all three. And the tendency in this direction doesn't even elicit a yawn in our culture. It's like, let it go. It's amazing. And then the toys that come with those things. I was reading in one paper, Starship Troopers, I don't even know what it was, but it was a science fiction movie two, three years ago. 
It was filled with violence, nudity, and objectionable language, and these alien bugs impaled, beheaded, and ate the brains of humans. And yet, the Starship Trooper toys were the biggest hit at Toys R Us because unknowing grandparents and parents who never have time to watch these grisly science fiction movies bought the toys and gave them out, which were linked to the movie with the wickedness. Well, I was reading, and I think, you know, as soon as you talk about specifics, people get all troubled. But I'd like to conclude with two things. Number one, I'd like to read to you what a dear pastor, uh, Kent Hughes, in Chicago, told his congregation a while back when he was preaching through Colossians. And I bumped into this, and I love it. He said this. I agree with him. I'll quote him. I am aware of the wise warning to never use words like all, every, and always. It's always bad to absolutize your pronouncements. But I'm going to do it anyway, he said. Here it is. It's impossible for any Christian who spends the bulk of their evenings, month after month, and week upon week, day in and day out, watching the major TV networks or contemporary videos to ever maintain a Christian mind. It's like... You get it started and you neutralize it. You get it started and you neutralize it. You get it started and you neutralize it. I'm not talking about what we're exposed to just living life. I'm talking about what we choose to look at. Paul said, Philippians 2.1, let Christ's mind be in you. Colossians 3.16, let Christ's word dwell in you. Romans 12.1 and 2, present your mind to God to renew. What's the goal? Cultivating the mind of Christ. What's the scandal? Christians neglect this area immensely. What's the cure? Well, it's available this morning. Plan how to saturate your mind with the word. Do you remember Paul's list in Colossians 3? 13 stops, 12 starts. Let me read to you, just to close, a list of how to recover your Godward mind, ways to return to our rest in Jesus, written by the Navigators. Dawson Trotman started this group of people that memorized the Bible, and they're a big discipleship group, and they're all over the world. The Navigators published this list. I thought it was great. This is a list. It's not laws. It's a list of guidelines, they put it, and I thought they were fantastic. Number one, guard against media constituting your only barrier to loneliness. You know what God says? I will be with you always, even to the end of the earth. I am your God, and, and look to me. And you know what people say? I'm, I'm so lonesome, I've got to watch TV. And they... That's their companion, the media. Instead of the God of the universe that said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, and lo, I am with you always. You say, but I can't see him, and he's not in color. You know what I mean? It, 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 he'll make it in color in your mind. Number two, establish media limits. You know, it's okay to have a television. I mean, we're not, we're not iconoclast and believe we should pile them all up in the parking lot and smash them with sledgehammers and pour kerosene and burn them. But the test is, can you discipline yourself to not watch it for periods of time? This is what the navigators say. Establish a media limit. No TV allowed till homework chores are done. Maximum of seven hours a week. Limit the number of channels. Beyond television, limit Nintendo, Sega, Walkman, Internet. See, see if you can live without media. Most people can't. You turn off the, the, the tunes and you turn off the TV and you turn off the games and you don't let them pop a movie in when you're gone and they just... The boredom level has been reset too. People are bored in 30 seconds if there's not something happening. Number three, have non-electric children's parties. You ever thought of having a party without a movie or a video game or the arcade? Number four, resist advertisements. Try it. Don't wear the most modern thing. Have, don't have the newest gizmo. When everyone says, have you upgraded to the G53? You say, what is it? And why do you need it? You know, I mean, you know, zap the set. I mean, turn it off. We have a rule. If they do something objectionable, we won't watch the rest of it. It's their fault. They offended us. That's a good way. Um, fast from the media. All through God's word, the notion of, of fasting occurs. Media, perhaps, is the most important kind of fast. Have a no television week or better a month. Don't listen to the news for a week. Pray in your car instead of listening to the radio or even music. I mean, you can pray out loud. Talk to God. And then if somebody's in the car, talk with them about God. Wow, what an idea. Re regain the control of the value system of your family. If, if you do not know what your children are listening to and watching, 
then you have lost control of the value system of your home. Hate evil. God says, hate it. And, and let those that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Not go toward it and pay to get it. Depart, God says. Substitute soothing music. You know, everybody has different views on music, but listen to that which calms your spirit. That's the biblical purpose of music, to calm your spirit and to let your spirit be lifted in worship. Encourage reading. Do family things. And their list is great. What's the bottom line? God wants to have our mind. Our busy schedules and the onslaught of media erode a Godward mind. God says, then set aside time, come away from everything, and focus on me.